Peace and blessings, dear comrades and friends. I'm very happy uh, to meet uh, one of my comrades, um, one of the great activists uh, against imperialism, against Zionism, one of the people whom, to my uh, view, really embodies the, 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 the Jewish prophetic uh, urge to rise up against every form of injustice. Um, Dr. Uh, Abraham Weisfeld, um, who sometimes lives in uh, occupied Canada, sometimes lives in occupied Palestine, mm -hmm. and who's ready to liberate all these nations, um, God willing. Thank you, uh, Dr. Abraham, uh, to uh, grant us this interview. I really hope that it may inspire uh, people in next generations to continue this fight uh, until one day we will all be free. Yes, uh, the power of words is uh, enormous and unlimited. Uh, as uh, the, uh, uh, the philosopher uh, Avero said, you know, words have wings and nothing can stop them. They are free. And no, we even have the waves of the internet to spread the words. So um, we're doing this interview as a series of interviews because 50 years ago uh, this year, um, some a few hundreds of uh, Christian comrades came together in Chile, which was at that time trying to build uh, a new socialist way of living. It was before their revolution was crushed by Pinochet. And 50 years ago, in 1972, they started an organization called Christians for Socialism. We want to continue and expand on this work, and we try to organize progressives, leftists, socialists um, from all faith traditions. And uh, in this interview, we have a few questions that we uh, ask all our comrades. And, and the first are actually about this word socialism, a, a word that um, today sounds a bit old fashioned to some, sounds still diabolically scary to others. And for others, it, it, it's still a word that expresses their deepest hopes. So um, can you explain what the word socialism means to you personally? Hmm. Let me inter introduce the topic uh, by uh, uh, my expressing uh, uh, immense respect for your work, uh, Cornel, uh, as an authentic uh, Christian and not the... Uh, the Christ, state Christianity that is imposed upon the American uh, dollar bill, which says, in God we trust, as if God were a bank, you know, uh, you know, providing uh, collateral for the value of the dollar bill. There's, uh, you know, that type of Christianity, which seems to be uh, popular amongst uh, about 30% uh, of the American public, and uh, in Canada as well, you know, there uh, seems to be a similar movement currently occupying the capital of Canada and Ottawa and uh, also moving towards the capital of Quebec as well. It's quite a phenomenon, but uh, it's not authentic. It's a populist, you know, movement and uh, Christianity uh, as practiced, you know, by the state in the West is uh, simply a, an ideology and not a, uh, and not a philosophy uh, as you do practice. That's what socialism is for me. It's, it's, you know, where uh, people govern themselves and not by, uh, you know, uh, electing a puppet, but by actually organizing themselves to live uh, collectively. Uh, this is a great problem, you know, which uh, religious philosophies have contributed, uh, uh, you know, uh, their solution to, because the uh, fundamental problem, I, as I see it, even for socialism, is that... Uh, People are, we are people, we are animals, much like uh, other animals. And, uh, you know, our uh, sense, our, our cognitive, you know, senses uh, oriented towards uh, survival and, and uh, so, uh, reproduction and social reproduction. And this is all based upon self-interest. Now, religion may uh, try to overcome this uh, problem of self-interest uh, uh, on the individual level by offering an incentive uh, to follow the uh, what is called the law of uh, 
of the of the deity as transmitted by its prophets so it's a question of respecting law which is a code or constitution of social cohesion and a mutual self-aid or individual self-interest as promoted by capitalist system uh, and promoted by the protestant religions you know which are based upon the uh, seeking of uh, uh, individual and familial uh, prosperity by virtue of the blessings of Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay, so there's, you know, like all sorts of attributes, you know, they're claimed to be religious, but which are more so ideological. And they all have a certain sort of, you know, uh, pretext to uh, seeking something like socialism as an objective, you know, heaven, of course, is socialist, you know, in heaven, there's no money, you don't have to pay anything, you know, everything is free, everybody loves each other, you know, like it's like socialism, right? So, <clears throat> You know, it's it's uh, it's very much connected, you know, with people's ambitions to be more than just, you know, a simple animal that eats, sleeps and drinks, you know, like, you know, there's got to be more than that. You know, people have figured that out and they've been searching for that, whatever it is, you know, like since, uh, you know, like forever. So <clears throat> socialism, you know, has to be something that we build intellectually before we can build it materially because we don't know what to build if otherwise. So, you know, socialism has to be defined and uh, contributions to this uh, prospect have been made, you know, by all of the religions, all of the Abrahamic religions. And I would add, you know, Buddha, Buddhism as well. <clears throat> I'm not sure about Hindu religion, but, uh, uh, you know, socialism has to be something that even goes beyond what has been postulated as a collective self-interest. Okay, so in capitalism, you know, you know we have the, the promotion of individual self-interest and uh, we have critiqued that and we propose to overcome it, you know, by socialism. But even in socialism, we have a problematic, you know, because collective self-interest, nonetheless, does not overcome the problems with which we are confronted. And I mean, um, industrialization, even if it's conducted under socialist auspices, and even when, you know, a third world uh, country has liberated itself nationally and has become an independent country, it is nonetheless selling off, you know, its oil reserves as fast as it can, you know, for the, the best price possible for the sake of either its national bourgeoisie or the sake of alleviating, alleviating poverty in that society. But in either case, even when it's done for socialistic purposes, it is nonetheless killing off the planet by selling off the oil. The oil should just be, you know, kept re in reserve in the earth, you know, it should not be touched. You know, enough of this, you know, <clears throat> attacking the planet, you know, in which we're trying to live. So, you know, I think that uh, we have to open up the discussion to include, you know, the prospects offered by religious thought in addition to the political theories that have been developed to define what socialism is or is to be. Um, just a quick note, being a Muslim, I'm very honored that you call me a good Christian, um, uh. <laughs> because being a Muslim, I try to be a good Jew and a good Christian as well. Um, so, but um, you've, you've had a long career of, of struggles, and um, I can imagine that your idea of socialism or of a better society has changed also in the course of these years. Um, in, in in what way has it changed? What what have you learned over all these years? Well, you, you know, I was uh, educated in uh, in a socialist uh, in thought, socialist thought. You know, because uh, my parents were both socialists, not the same kind of socialists, but uh, my mother was uh, a Jewish Bundist from Warsaw. She was more cosmopolitan. You know working, you know, woman, independent working woman, and uh, coming from an orthodox uh, family. And my father also uh, uh, a socialist, but from a religious, you know, uh, direction. And he was, uh, you know, much more religious coming from a shtetl called Bielki, just outside of Lublin uh, in the south of Poland. 
And when they were collected uh, by the Nazis, they were put into the Lublin ghetto from which he escaped. And my mother escaped from the Warsaw ghetto as well. Both very uh, determined people, intelligent people, dedicated people, religious people and socialist uh, people. And so um, I grew up uh, in uh, the more cosmopolitan uh, context of my mother's, you know, uh, to be a Jewish Bundist. I was always a Jewish Bundist. And that has never changed. But, you know, being a Jewish Bundist from Warsaw, second generation Holocaust survivor, is not the same as being a Jewish Bundist, you know, from Montreal or New York. <laughs> because, you know, the New York and Montreal people, you know, they're living in a, uh, they, in, you know, in, in a in society that would allow for a certain degree of integration. And so they became more assimilated. And uh, Bundism was more a matter of um, uh, Yiddishkeit uh, rather than socialism. <clears throat> So uh, then, you know, were to be active, you know, like the age of 16, I decided I need to be politically active because I realized, you know, that, you know, we had to uh, uh, protect ourselves. It's not even a matter of no choice. It's, it's not a, a choice, you know, to support socialism. It's a matter of necessity, you know, because you have to protect yourself in order to prevent another Holocaust. You know, this is the, the point of departure in my own thinking. So I went uh, to the uh, New Democratic Party, which is a social democratic party, which is the only socialist, you know, institution in the country that I knew of in Toronto. And uh, uh, in addition to the uh, Workmen's Workers' Circle in Toronto, which um, had a Bundes chapter in it, but of the Canadian Jew Jewish community. The Canadian Jewish community was completely different, you know, than the refugee community. And, and I never got really integrated into them even though, you know, part of my family was very well integrated and uh, successful, you know, in Canadian society. So uh, I met up with the, uh, the revolutionary tendency in the Democratic Party, which was the Trotskyists of the Fourth International, not the per Parisian Mandel tendency, but the Canon American tendency it was affiliated. <clears throat> the League for Socialist Action was affiliated with the Socialist Workers Party of the United States began, and uh, became dominated by it afterwards after Cannon was gone. And there, you know, I just did my own work, basically, you know, because, uh, well, except that, you know, no, I did everything. <laughs> so, but the Trotskyist, you know, movement wasn't a movement, it was a party. And that's what, you know, eventually taught me to, and others, you know, 18 of us, you know, who split, we formed another movement which was more intellectual, which was more into writing and thinking <clears throat> and developing documentation to, to codify it. And, uh, <clears throat> and we left with the, uh, <clears throat> with the post-World War II uh, founder of the Trotskyist movement in Canada, uh, Ross Dowson. He, he left with us because he couldn't take the dogmatism of the others you know, who were in a, you know, this frenzied you know, competition with the Mandel tendency and they you know, couldn't, were not capable of making in, in the, pos, the slightest possible concession you know, for, intellectual, for intellectual sake, you know, because it would have undermined their faction position. So that kind of discussion obviously was you know, uh, uh, unproductive and we left that. And even then afterwards, you know, the idea of having you know, an exclusive group, uh, you know, which, which was in competition with other such groups, you know, just didn't make any sense anymore either. <clears throat> and, uh, and I left that group to become independent and worked with the anarchists, worked with the Maoists later on in Montreal, who are very determined. And uh, the only sort of forum that invited me to speak about the publication of my <clears throat> first book on Sabra Shatila. So, I changed, <laughs> I changed an awful lot, you know. And now, you know, we found a way to, you know, form a united front in, in the United States and Britain called the uh, International uh, Communalist uh, Convergence uh, uh, Union, or United International <laughs> Communalist uh, Convergence. Communalism being the theory put forward by Huey P. Dr. Huey, Huey P. Newton. <clears throat> so that is a, a theory that I, that I am, am uh, very sort of, you know, comfortable in, especially because, you know, it uh, explains, you know, third worldism as, uh, as a solution to the problematic, you know, in the first world, 
in which the working class has not, you know, risen to the expectations of Marxism as being a revolutionary class because the aristocracy of labor has been able to uh, co-op the working class as a whole, which comprises about 60% of the population or did. So, uh, you know, third world became the, the motor force, you know, of world revolution and not the, you know, the working class of the advanced capitalist countries as postulated, you know, in Marxist theory, which is fine when it comes to political economy, but, you know, in political theory it has great failings, including its lack of understanding of national consciousness. So, you know, that, that's, that's about it. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask what tendencies uh, you feel closely related to, but you, you already have answered half of that question. Yes. But maybe I think that not so many people actually know what Bundism is as a very specific... Um, Ashkenazi, Russian, Polish, Jewish uh, movement. Yes. Can you explain that a little further? And, and maybe also how Bundism um, as a very internationalist movement, how it relates to Zionism, which is still seen as the Jewish policy by, by many people. Mm. Um, yes, very good question. Um, well, the Jewish Bund, you know, was the revolutionary Jewish working class. You know, we were a uh, majority of the Jewish working class in Poland in the last elections that took place in Warsaw. And uh, of course, the uh, entire Jewish working class was, uh, was a, uh, exterminated by the Nazi uh, occupation. And we were sold out by the, by the uh, USSR administration under Stalin as well, and handed over to the Nazis in uh, 1940 in the agreement that the uh, USSR and uh, it's Foreign Minister Molotov made, you know, with the Rubentrop, my Foreign Minister of the Nazi regime. And then, uh, you know, the, the rest of Poland was occupied by the Nazis thereafter. And uh, only uh, some Jewish people, like my mother and father, escaped into, the, uh, into Russia. Uh, not with uh, the blessings of, uh, of Russia at the time either. So... Uh, the Jewish Bund, you know, was lost, uh, except for the refugees. And we kept a certain cohesion apart from the uh, Canadian uh, Jewish Bund in, uh, in Toronto, but we had an association for the refugees who are mostly Bundes called the Warsawa um, Lodge Mutual Benefit Society. And uh, that was uh, all the refugees who came from the two, um, to two ghettos. Nazi ghettos of Warsaw and Lodz, who were uh, brought together after the Lodz ghetto was um, solved and everybody, all those uh, refugees were moved into Warsaw. So there's 350,000 refugees, you know, cramped into a, you know, a, a couple of square kilometers of space in the middle of Warsaw. And uh, after they were shipped out to uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, there was about 30,000 left and it took th two years for that remaining 30,000 to finally decide to revolt. And you know, the revolt of the, uh, the Jewish ghetto in 1943, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which was the first resistance against the Nazi occupation on continental Europe, <laughs> you know, really, you know, uh, everybody else had just collapsed, you know, before the Nazi machine. You know, Stalin thought that he, uh, that you know, uh, Hitler was going to respect uh, the non-invasion agreement that they made. Uh, Chamberlain was busy making an agreement with Hitler to divide up Czechoslovakia. I like, and the Zionists were also making agreements, you know, with the Nazi regime, you know, to get their membership out and to uh, make some business deals, you know, to provide you know the Zionists, you know, with the, the basic infrastructure to start their state state project. So that's, you know, like a, an example of, you know, the difference between the Jewish Bund and the, and the Zionists, because we were getting ready to resist and to fight back against the Nazis, and we did. And even the Zionists had to join in with us, you know, to resist the Nazis because they were inside the ghetto and they had no, no other choice, which proves the validity of the Jewish Bund's position, which is Dorkeit, which means hereness. You have to live and fight here in order to ensure your survival. And you have to fight against fascism anywhere in order to prevent its uh, uh, return, you know, to where 
where you are yourself. You know, the struggle against fascism is not only local, it's international, much like the struggle against the coronavirus. It has to be eradicated entirely in order to prevent its resurgence. And that's why, you know, the current uh, campaign against coronavirus is failing because, you know, the rich countries kept all the vaccines for themselves. You know, they thought, you know, like self-interest, you know, was logical, was their logic, national nationalistic logic. And of course, you know, it merely led to the creation of nests, of fermentation, of new varieties of the virus, you know, which overcame the vaccine with which they thought they were protected with in the first place, you know. It's so, it's so pathetic, you know, the, the level of science, you know, healthcare and, uh, and the, the ideologies that are promoted, you know, in the world, you know, today. It's, it's really primitive. I think that we're still in a primitive, primitive stage of um, evolution, you know, intellectually. Uh, so I think Marx once used the image of, of, of um, Marx said that um, human history will soon begin. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the, 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 the capitalist intellectual said that history was over, but Marx said it will soon begin and then human, humanity will finally leave its adolescence to become adult. And, uh, yes, yes. Um, you, you said that you were also active um, with anarchists and Maoists and social democrat and Trotskyite uh, comrades. Yes. Uh, being a Jewish person, was your Jewishness ever a problem in, or was it a, a, an advantage in these uh, spaces? Um, no, it wasn't an advantage, never, you know. I mean, none of these tendencies and none of the people that I worked with, except for the other, other Jewish people, ever cared about, you know, being a second generation Holocaust survivor. Nobody ever asked me anything about it. You know, nobody ever asked me to speak about it, certainly not, you know, in public. Oh, no, we don't want, you know, <laughs> anybody to be speaking about Jewishness, you know, in public. Oh, no, <laughs> that wouldn't do, you know, because, every, you know, the working class is not Jewish. Therefore, you know, it's not important, you know, that kind of an attitude. Okay, so. But uh, nonetheless, I accomplished a lot with, the, with those tendencies. And uh, when I was working with the anarchists, um, you know, there, there was a uh, campaign against uh, the uh, cruise missile production in Canada. And in, in Toronto, there was a Christian liberation group, you know, that started, you know, um, uh, weekly demonstrations against uh, an American military factory in Toronto that was building the guidance system for the cruise missile, which was the most crucial component. It was the, the whole essence of the thing. And so we're demonstrating there all along, you know, getting, you know, shoved around by the cops, arrested, da -da -da -da. And nobody paying any attention. And then a group of anarchists came from Vancouver and blew off the front wall of the factory, you know, with a van full of dynamite, you know, not killing anybody, you know, at nighttime. So then, you know, I ended up going to Ottawa to work with the uh, uh, Palestine Embassy in order to, you know, uh, fight off the Israel invasion of Lebanon and the subsequent, you know, massacre of the refugee camps in Sabr Shatila. And so I was in Ottawa, you know, I was reading, and then I discovered, you know, that the government had secretly made a, 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 a military agreement with the United States of America, which was illegal because it wasn't, you know, announced in the House of Commons to test the cruise missile in Western Canada. So I went to the Parliament Hill and I started a protest in the public gallery. And then we started a tent. We, you know, put a peace, peace camp tent on the front lawn of the Parliament building on public grounds under English common law which I had, you know, read about, you know, so I knew the legal sort of, you know, basis on which we were doing so. This tent camp, you know, lasted more than two years and severely embarrassed two governments and helped to bring down two governments as well. So this is the type of work I, I, I was doing with the anarchists, you know, I loved doing that kind of stuff, you know, whereas the Trotskyists, you know, all they knew how to do, you know, was to run a meeting <laughs> and set up committees. <laughs> well, you know, in the latter part, you know, at the beginning, they were great, you know, because they helped to build double the size of the anti-war movement. You know, the Communist Party built um, demonstrations of 20,000. And then so did the Trotskyists, you know, in coalition with others, you know, build up a, a demonstration, another contingent of 20,000 people demonstrating against the war in Vietnam. So, you know, it was OK. We did a lot of stuff. And then nonetheless. Yeah. Would there be 
one person in, in, in all these different movements and, and, and um, leftist traditions that you've uh, um, come in acquaintance with, would there be one person that you say, this was a particularly inspiring person, dead or alive, somebody you, you have met or not? Uh, oh, uh, uh, yes, to go back to the beginning, you know, I would say that uh, my mother's brother, in effect, my uncle, but I never, I wasn't alive at the same time. So that's why I call him my mother's brother. He was the one who started the Underground Railway to uh, smuggle people out of the Warsaw Ghetto into uh, the Russian forest. So he set up a camp in the forest there and uh, brought out a lot of women, you know, from the ghetto in order to preserve the nation. And then, you know, with the Russian invasion, he became a partisan as well. And then uh, was conscripted into the Red Army thereafter. And then, you know, we, and then it was lost. We don't, we presume that he was lost, you know, because we have no further information about him. His name was Meyer Goldscheider, and he's my inspiration. Yes. And then my mother, and then the leader of the, uh, the founder of the Canadian Trotsky's movement, Ross Dowson. And then, you know, the intellectual um, Wayne Roberts, you know, as well, who was in the Trotsky's movement. These are all great people. And the prisoner solidarity movement was Jim Campbell in Toronto as well. A lot of great people. Um, then we, we've been talking about um, Jewishness, uh, Deutschkeit, uh, Yiddishkeit, and so on. Um, but what does the word Jewish mean to you personally? How how would you um, explain Yiddishkeit, Jewishness uh, for you? Uh, Jewishness is... Uh, um, uh, my cultural identity, my national identity. I am Jewish. You know, when somebody asks me, you know, what are you? I would say I am Jewish, you know, rather than Canadian or Quebecois, un unless I was in Palestine. Like when I was arrested and detained, you know, at a military base, you know, of the, uh, of the uh, occupying force there. And uh, this one soldier, you know, we're blindfolded, eight of us, you know, we're blindfolded and handcuffed and, you know, tie tied, you know, hands tied, uh, plastic tie tied uh, for 26 hours, you know, in the middle of the night, you know, the, one of the soldiers comes and, you know, sits down and says to me, so you're Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Jewish. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then he says, uh, and, and no, it started off, you know, like he asked me yeah, if I was Jewish and I said, yes, I am a uh, uh, Yehudi Philistini. I'm a Jewish. Yes. I said, I think I spoke in English. I said, I am an a Jewish Palestinian. And I repeated in Arabic, you know, Yehudi Philistini. And that's when, you know, like I could hear everybody sort of, you know, slap to it, snap to attention. And then he said to me, don't you want to live in Israel? <laughs> you know, in that way. And I said, no, I want to live in Palestine. And then he shut up, you know, and left me alone. And then I didn't talk anymore. I should have, you know, made a speech or something, but, you know, it was dangerous, you know, because, you know, you weren't allowed to talk. If you did talk or sang, you know, like the one guy did, you get slapped in the head until you're unconscious. So they were violent with us. It was torture. And uh, so, you know, that's my, my identity, you know, like uh, a Jewish identity, uh, which was uh, an uh, Orthodox, you know, I was Orthodox until the age of 14. So I was very religious, you know, completely religious. And uh, we were modern religious because my father was, you know, working class and he shaved off his beard in order to get a job, he told me. And, uh, and so that's what's the difference is, you know, basically between Orthodox and modern Orthodox is, you know, shaving off the beard. <laughs> now I have a beard, so I must be Orthodox. Uh, but uh, uh, even then, you know, the religion, you know, was a national identity with, you know, uh, with me, you know, because uh, we were people who had a certain way of living, had a certain way of thinking that we wanted to preserve and that we considered it to be important to preserve because it was um, a more precise way of thinking and a more communal way of thinking than that with which we were living within in the Christian nation states. So, you know, we wanted to preserve that, you know, for, for many reasons. And I, I think we had good reason to do so. And, and uh, religion was one way of doing so. So, uh, you know, uh, the Jewish Bund uh, does not have a position uh, on religion, you know, like it has members that are both religious and non-religious, orthodox and non-orthodox. Non so, uh, 
you know, the Jewish Bund, you know, Jewish identity, you know, you know, uh, sustains me the most, you know, in terms of what I actually am. Um, and, uh, and that's ir irrespective of, of uh, religious belief and in fact as well. Um, it's just that, you know, religion becomes part of the national culture rather than dominating the national culture and defining the national culture. And as such, it becomes um, something which is uh, open to uh, redefinition. There's a metaphor which I've used previously, which I would um, uh, present to define any nation. If you draw a metaphor with a river, let's say, and you have you know, the water flowing down the river, otherwise it's not a river, and the river continues on like that you know, for eons and eons. However, uh, as the, river, uh, the water flows down the river, the river never stays the same, even though it is a river. And this is what I mean by national culture and religion as well. And that's, and that's what I see you know, in the religions that are intellectually sustainable. You know, when you have, like uh, in, in Isla, Islam, you have all the hadiths. And I'm looking, I'm searching for a book of the hadith called uh, the book of uh, uh, Aisha, which uh, I have uh, a certain sort of uh, interest in finding. And in uh, Judaism, of course, you have uh, you know, all the books of the Talmud, which do uh, interpretations, debates, and uh, developments. And then you have the philosophers you know, in the Jewish tradition as well, like uh, uh, Maimonides and uh, Spinoza, who uh, integrate you know, rationality into, uh, and scientific, uh, scientific rationality into uh, you know, religious philosophy and integrate the two of them in a meaningful way. So there's all of that to take into consideration. Um, that, that was a lot. It, it was quite interesting, but um, on, on quite a theoretical level. Um, to you personally, um, being a refugee, being a second generation Holocaust survivor, an activist, um, and since you do have some beard, an Orthodox Jew, um, what, what, what does it mean to you personally? How did your history and the history of your family help shape your identity? Uh, well, growing up in, in Toronto, I was told that uh, I, I couldn't go across the uh, dividing line of... Uh, of uh, Bathurst Street because on the other side of Bathurst Street lived the Christians who would beat me up, okay? And then, uh, and in the, uh, I switched over into a public school system, you know, Protestant public school system um, in the second year of uh, my uh, primary studies after doing a year of uh, day school. So I went to night school, uh, Jewish night school thereafter and uh, went to Jewish and uh, Protestant day school, uh, public school, you know, uh, at the same time. So I did two school systems at the same time. And, uh, and then the first year I had to repeat because I didn't know English, you know, because my first language isn't English, you know, it's Yiddish. See, this is Yiddish. And it's like the Germanic, you know, dialects of Europe as well. Ich verstehe, ich muss lernen. Yeah. So, uh, but in, uh, like, okay, see. So, um, you know, it's... Uh, I was very, you know, like um, insular, you know, like in a, like living in a uh, in a world within a world, in, in uh, you know, because you know I, I didn't talk with any of the Christians, you know, because Christians were dangerous. One, Christians didn't want to talk with me because you know I was Jewish, and uh, and uh, and that was it, you know, like I and and the only time, you know, you know, so I didn't really have any of. Uh, uh, exposure, you know, to the um, English society, 
Uh, and I only had trouble, you know, from the English Society in grade six, for instance, you know, I had a, a British teacher, British English Anglo Canadian teacher, you know, Mr. Gardner, who announced to the class at one point, you know, that the Jews, the Jews killed the Christian babies in the Middle Ages. So this is my first act of revolt. This is, you know, how I came to be, you know, now confronted, you know, with something like that. So without permission, I stood up, you know, shouted at the teacher and pointed at him and saying, that's a lie. You know, and you can't tell, you can't say that, you know, you can't say that a teacher is lying, you know, to you when you're a student, you know, this is not permitted. It's the greatest sin possible, you know, in a school system like that, and especially the British school system, where you sang God save the queen in the morning, and then the Christians, uh, you know, recited the Lord's Prayer uh, after that as well. So, you know, that's, you know, that's the kind of environment that I was confronted with, and uh, I developed a very strong, uh, let's say, personality in order to cope with it. And, uh, and so, you know, like, I, I couldn't really be led around by any political ideology as well, you know, because, uh, because of that independence of thought that I had developed. Even though I was alone, even though I was one, I still had confidence in myself that I had the logic uh, on my side. I'm actually shocked that this is a story uh, from after the, 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 the Shoah from uh, <laughs> mid 20th century Canada, that, that, that this was said in school. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know these stories were spread, but one would think that a history teacher or, or any teacher would at least know that these were stories used to oppress the Jewish people. Uh, no, no, no. The, the, at the time, you know, the Holocaust was known and there had to be some sort of an explanation why the Holocaust had taken place. And so, so part of the blame for the Holocaust had to be shifted onto the Jewish people in order for the Christians to feel okay about being Christian because it was the Christians who carried out the Holocaust in the first place. So they had to, they had to find a, a trick to psychologically, you know, release themselves of the guilt with which they were uh, being confronted with by my existence <laughs> I, I i remember that uh, when i was in school um the effect of the holocaust had been that we don't talk about jewish people they're fine they're they're, they're great people and we shouldn't have killed them but we don't talk about them yeah <laughs> um, and except jesus was a jew but he was the only good one all the rest were bad <laughs> something like that but yeah yeah same thing there was yeah. some fear to 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 be explicitly anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic, especially in the schools. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Which unfortunately is changing in, in, in this uh, time when all these conspiracy myths are going rampant. Yeah. People are picking up old anti-Semitic tropes once again. Yeah, even the academics, you know, the American academics wrote that book about the, uh, the Zionist lobby, the Israel lobby, they call it. But, you know, the words uh, Israel, Israeli, Zionist are considered to be a synonym, you know, for Jewish. So they're essentially sort of arguing, you know, for the credibility of what they call, you know, a Jewish lobby. And they're blaming it on, you know, at this, and they're blaming this Jewish lobby on the Jewish people. They're saying that this is the, the leadership who are representing the Jewish people. When in fact, Zionism is, you know, far from that. Because, first of all, empirically, the majority of the Jewish people don't live in Israel. Okay. Two, that means the majority of the people don't have a vote in Israel which means the government of Israel cannot represent the Jewish people and do not have a mandate, you know, to represent the Jewish people, neither by precedent nor by uh, electoral uh, uh, justifications. Then, uh, Israel, if it claims to be a Jewish nation state, is uh, acting contrary to such a notion uh, because it is allied, you know, with the enemies of the Jewish people. That is the fascists, you know, who are pro-Zionist United States, the, the Protestant evangelicals, evangelicals who are consider themselves to be Christian Zionists and who fund the settlers and all of this. And Israel is promoting the growth of these fascist tendencies in the United States of America, where there are more Jewish people than in Israel. So how does Israel represent the Jewish people? It doesn't. So uh, to call, you know, Israel Jewish or a Jewish nation state is incorrect. That's only, you know, propaganda from the Zionist movement. To refer to um, Jewish supremacy practiced by Israel 
uh, over the occupied territories and within Israel itself is incorrect as well. This is a Zionist white supremacy. And even the Israeli left opposition makes this mistake and refers to, you know, Betzlam refers to Jewish supremacy. You know, in their bubble, you know, they can only think in terms of, you know, Jewish and Arab, you know, <laughs> but they're not Jewish, Jewish. They are Jewish Zionists. And by using the term Jewish, they're talking about the entire Jewish people, which they have, you know, no sort of, you know, consciousness of. So it's really uh, uh, underdeveloped conditions, you know, which undermine the struggle against Zionism and the Zionist state. The Palestinians are more advanced in such a domain and understand what the Jewish people are much more than, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, old Jewish opposition and uh, the uh, Israeli Jewish opposition. And when I'm in Nablus, you know, everybody calls me, you know, uh, Dr. Abraham, and they consider me to be um, a Jewish Palestinian. And they say, yes, we know not all Zionists are Jewish and not all uh, Jewish people are Zionists. That's what they're taught in the school. <laughs> you know, and this is taught in the Palestinian school and not in the Israeli school and not in the English school for sure. Um, you were speaking about the, the old Jewish opposition. You mean um, those who condemn uh, Zionism from religious reasons? No, um, those who condemn Zionism for reasons of assimilation. See, the, there was two major tendencies uh, that were anti-Zionism in the Jewish political culture. In Eastern yes. Europe, it was the Jewish Bund, socialist, uh, a national movement for uh, Jewish liberation, but opposed to Zionism, you know, and opposed to fascism. In the Western Europe, the tendency was for assimilation as a means to overcome Jewish oppression. And all Jewish people were supposed to pass and look like Christians. And therefore nobody would know uh, uh, that you're Jewish and cannot uh, discriminate against you because they don't know that you're Jewish. And here people in, in Cath old Catholic Quebec, they would change their names for Jewish names to be an English name so that they would be treated you know, uh, with a certain degree of respect or deference rather. So, you know, the assimilationist tendency failed because the Nazis, you know, in the most civilized, you know, country in the world, sought out, you know, all the assimilated Jewish people as they were sought out, you know, under the uh, Spanish, you know, Catholic regime of Ferdinand and Isabella, Isabella and Ferdinand, who even, you know, expelled and killed off, you know, the Jewish people who had converted to Christianity, Catholicism. So assimilation, you know, failed twice. The Jewish Bund, though, was only suppressed and killed off, killed off by the Nazis and suppressed by the, uh, the Russian Communist Party, which banned the Jewish Bund in 1921. Hmm. They said it was not necessary because they already had the ideal party that would uh, solve everything. Yes, well, some of the Jewish Bundists did go and join the Communist Party, hmm. and then they formed a, a Jewish subsection of the Communist Party that was later on all killed off by Stalin, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, for the sin of forming a, a Jewish anti-fascist committee. And the two Bundes leaders were put into prison and died there. This is, you know, how the Bund was treated there. So the Bund in political theory remains valid, but in actuality is very weak. And we're in the process of rebuilding it now. Um, and I've seen that this is um, actually, there are already quite a few chapters um, in, in, in Canada, in the United States. Yes. Is, is it the same organization that is now active in Australia uh, to no. start? The, no. Australia and Melbourne, the Jewish Bund there is, you know, a Yiddishkeit, you know, cultural association. Mm. I've asked them to take a position, you know, in solidarity with the Palestinians, and they've never replied to that request. Okay. And neither the Bund in New York nor the uh, official chapter here in Montreal has said anything. Not that they're, you know, young enough to do anything about it. You know, they're just sort of, you know, all gone practically. And their children were not raised in the tradition. You know, they were, you know, educated to assimilate, you know, to, to make themselves, you know, um, a, a personally a better life, you know, in Canada. And so the Jewish Bund was lost from them. But the... Uh, Jewish Socialist Bund, the, the Jewish Revolutionary Socialist Bund, you know, that I am helping to rebuild, uh, and others, uh, you know, on their own, you know, began as well, has its uh, 
you know, was this uh, most, you know, active chapter in Phoenix, Arizona, where they're confronted with the greatest th threat, you know, of, uh, the, of fascism, you know, with the Nazis having infiltrated two police divisions uh, there in uh, Phoenix and Glendale. And, uh, you know, the uh, general sort of reactionary character of the political culture there. And, uh, and actually, um, five of our members were lost in a massacre that took place at a reconstructionalist uh, synagogue in uh, 2019, when a, a Nazi was allowed to uh, uh, enter into the synagogue and kill off everybody uh, with a police perimeter being established around that action. So there's that chapter, which has uh, a few remaining members. Now there's a new uh, Toronto chapter. There's uh, my Montreal chapter here. And then there's uh, the international chapter of the J, uh, JPLO, the Jewish PLO, in effect, founded in 18, 1989, which is the Jewish People's Liberation Organization, which operates virtually. So, yeah, I guess, you know, we've got, you know, uh, a solid, you know, presence now, which is uh, um, irrefutable and uh, is able to enter into uh, um, a debate, you know, with the Zionist movement as a whole and uh, hold its ground and contest, you know, the Zionist precept, you know, that uh, they are merely the national liberation movement of the Jewish people and exercising, you know, Jewish self-determination by establishing a state, as is the right of any nation, supposedly. Okay, this is what they claim. This is the justification, you know, for Zionism. But, you know, by doing so, they deny the very same right on the part of the Palestinians. So they're not, you know, really, you know, working for self-determination. They cannot claim self-determination if they're denying self-determination at the same time. It's a fundamental contradiction. So what they're actually practicing is fascism. And that's, you know, a nation state, you know, sovereign nation state that claims all the rights for itself, you know, that are superior to the rights of any other nation. That's called fascism. I think that, that that's even the core of every state. A state is only possible by denying other people's the right to have their own state in the same place. Yeah. Um, that's... Uh, I think that your analysis is quite correct on that point. Um, we have formed a constitutional uh, uh, recipe for that, you know, in the uh, in the uh, communalist uh, convergence, which uh, includes, you know, the members of the Brit of the Black Panther Party who are now, you know, working in the Maoist movement as well. Uh, we're all, you know, uh, affiliated with each other now, and uh, and doing a broadcast on the. YouTube ch uh, Pantherism channel with uh, Steve Struggle. And we have constitution proposed, you know, using the uh, Bundes formula of national cultural autonomy. This is what we wanted for the Jewish people. We didn't want independence as a nation state like in the Zionists. We wanted to have our own autonomy so we could have our own cultural independence, etc., within the countries that are our homeland. My parents was as, were as much Polish as anybody else. And they wanted to stay in Poland. But they wanted to be Jewish as well, you know, so, you know, the dual identity is possible with national cultural autonomy, so you don't have to break up the country. So this is what, you know, is being proposed, you know, with Black Panther Party, that would be national cultural autonomy for the Black nation, for the Spanish nation in the United States, for the Jewish nation, which are called nationalities or nations, you know, but to call us ethnies or ethnic minorities, that doesn't carry a political identity with it. It doesn't grant us, you know, national cultural autonomy. You know, that's not sufficient, you know. We're not a community. We're not an ethnic, you know, identity. We are a nation, both nationalities in each of our homelands and a nation internationally, a people nation, not a state. And this people nation is defined by the religion. <laughs> and the constitution is called the Torah. <laughs> Mashallah. Actually, I think we have we have to do a follow up interview one day where you can explain this in detail, because this is a, a very interesting way of looking at nationhood, uh, at states, at uh, uh, um, it, it, it's something that is um, not often heard of. Usually nation and state are um, hmm. interchanged. Yes, that's a liberal, uh, liberal uh, philosophy, the, you know, the, the re liberal republic of the French Revolution, that's the model, that's the paradigm that's followed, you know, for the United Nations. United Nations is made up of 194 states, but there's 3,000 nations in the world. So, you know, how come the difference? You know, where do those other nations get represented? Well, the answer is they don't under that system 
of the nation states. You know, so the United Nations has to be transformed as well. So what we're proposing is a federation of uh, national cultural autonomies that includes, you know, uh, everybody in North America, including Mexico, you know, and Canada will form a federation. We don't need, you know, the nation state or 50 mini nation states as well. You know, like <laughs> this is too much. But we'll have to get back to the, 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 the topics of the interview. Um, yes. I was um, wondering, um, you, you spoke about uh, Orthodox Judaism. Um, you spoke about Poland, which was part of the, the, the place where the struggle between uh, the Mitnagdim, the, 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 uh, the Hasidim and uh, the Maskilim was fought, so to say, between um, different ideas of um, Judaism in a more and more modernizing world. Yes. I was wondering, which of the, 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 the traditions of Judaism do you feel most closely related to? Um, and if you say orthodoxy, I know that there are different ideas about what orthodoxy is. So if so, please explain. Hmm. Oh, well, uh, we're referring to the, um, the, uh, the Jewish Renaissance, which is called the Haskalah. Yes. The Haskalah was, uh, you know, generated by the writings of um, Maimonides and uh, Spinoza. And they created a, another, a strain of uh, orthodoxy, I would say, that was um, rationalist, that was, you know, uh, uh, in the scientific vein and uh, sought to integrate the two uh, modes of thinking into a common uh, philosophical perspective. And I think this succeeded. You know, and that's, that's where I sort of, you know, sit uh, and uh, stand, you know, on the shoulders of these people. But in terms of working, you know, with the Orthodox tendencies, I work with the Natura Karta and have always uh, done so. I was critical of them when they went to the conference with Ahmadinejad, you know, on the Holocaust. But nonetheless, you know, we, we were working together and uh, in various places, in not only uh, in North America, but in Jerusalem as well. With Rabbi uh, Meyer Hirsch. Uh, that's, uh, um, that, that's a group that, that's often portrayed as, as, as quite um, hardliners, um, extreme Haredi. Um, but yes. you seem to have other experiences with them. Yes, because they're political, they're, they're internationalists, they understand politics. They're very uh, cosmopolitan, as far as I'm concerned, you know, besides being religious. You know, there's, religion does not uh, preclude uh, anything else. <laughs> you know, it's not a, like a either or uh, situation. Uh, another uh, Jewish Orthodox tendency that I've worked with is uh, Lev Tahor, which is even more Orthodox than in Turkarta. It's an uh, uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, extreme ultra-orthodox. There's orthodox, ultra-orthodox, and then there's extreme ultra-orthodox, in which the women, you know, wear niqab. Yes. And um, they're, they're very anti-Zionist as well, and they've been expelled from Quebec, Ontario, Guatemala, Mexico, and now are to be found in, uh, I think they've gone to Iran. I was trying to get them, you know, a village in Libya, but that fell through in uh, 2011. Uh, it's, did you, being a socialist, being quite a leftist, do you still, do, do you always feel at home in, in those traditions? Um, well, I can imagine that um, Left Ahort isn't really a socialist organization, and I think it's a, an understatement. Yes, oh is, yes, is it, it was. It was socialist. They lived as a commune. They all lived together and they all lived, you know, as a communal organization. They were going to build a synagogue, you know, here in Quebec, north of Montreal. Now I asked to be their uh, secular teacher to teach, you know, the uh, scientific subjects, but uh, it didn't go, go through, you know, they were expelled, you know, from Quebec, you know, because the social services under the uh, control of some Zionist, you know, social workers were trying to take their children away from them and send them to their grandparents in Israel or something like that. I even had to, uh, I was even in a position of testifying for one of the children 
translating from her Yiddish, you know, to French, you know, for, for a psychiatrist who was coming to evaluate, evaluate whether or not she should remain with the foster family or return to her parents who were, you know, uh, within Tirukarta. Uh, uh, and the father was an activist within Tirukarta with whom I worked. And they were trying to take his children away from them. It was pathetic. Yeah. So they left. It's quite interesting that you say that that you were uh, that there were plans of having you as their secular teacher because in the media, Left the Whore is um, painted as uh, wanting to have nothing to do with secular knowledge. Yes, in, uh, it, depends. I, 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 it depends who's teaching, you see, because if they bring somebody in, you know, who's an anti-Semite, it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, it has to be somebody who's Jewish, and there was, you know, very few people who could do that, and who could also teach in Yiddish. So I was the perfect candidate. And then they would have been able to get the subsidies, you know, from the government, you know, for, for the school systems. But, you know, it was all uh, blown apart, unfortunately. And I know that we've had uh, Neture Karta and Left the Heart. There's also Satmar, which is like the third Haredi group. Oh, yes. Satmar is very big, you know, like 20,000 rallies, you know, in New York and that sort of thing with Rabbi Shapiro. But Rabbi Shapiro doesn't have a correct position on the Jewish national identity. He considers, you know, uh, Jewish orthodoxy in place of a national identity. And that's how he comes to a critique of Zionism. So he, he's, he doesn't have, you know, he doesn't have a, a, uh, a, 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 an academic, you know, critique. He has only a religious critique of Zionism. Mm. Um, going to religion, uh, you, you seem to uh, know quite a few different uh, tendencies and traditions within especially Orthodox Judaism. I was wondering if, um, if any of these, any of the people from those traditions, um, the Besht, uh, uh, Rabbi Nachman, uh, there have been so many if any has been a, of a particular inspiration uh, to you that you might think you could share with other people um, on a spiritual or the combination of political and spiritual level? No. I don't know. I don't know of any rabbis who've been able to write, you know, in a sophisticated way about uh, the uh, political problems. They, uh, they, they uh, adopt the... Uh, the religious uh, principles into political uh, speech and uh, they promote them in a public manner and uh, that's it you know they don't need to do any more than that and so they don't you know because they've got you know sufficiently developed position uh, but uh, there's a lot of you know like jewish academics you know otherwise mm -hmm. not in the orthodox tradition who are writing about you know a jewish identity now writing about anti-Semitism, uh, writing about um, intersectorialism as well, which recognizes yes. national identity uh, on a par or uh, superior to that of class identity. So there's lots of such work being done, you know, by the new Jewish academics, by the younger generations. And of course, the younger generations have formed their own, you know, organizations, activist organizations, which are in the tradition of the Jewish Bund, even if they don't identify with the Jewish Bund yet like Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, um, If Not Now, Break the Silence, Bend the Ark, all Jewish organizations, Code Pink, all Jewish, you know, formations, you know, movements of their own, which have mobilized their particular generations and identify as being Jewish, as uh, being leftists of some kind and uh, anti-Zionists. But, you know, they don't choose, you know, to identify as being a Jewish Bund, uh, yet because they don't consider it to be necessary. Um, and you have other questions, I think. Yes. Uh, so what does the word God mean to you personally? Hmm. Okay, difficult question. So begin by a, a definition, but really how can you define uh, the deity or deity? the word, the term, the concept. Okay, by definition or intuition, by in intuition defi intuitional definition, God is known as one, 
the unknowable, to the all-powerful, omnipotent, the all-present, omnipresent, the all-knowing, omniscient. Uh, this is a definition by intuition since the, the world and the universe cannot have been made by humans. And so there must have been another force that is able to do so. So this is, you know, why the deity is, is considered to be such, you know, by first principles, by intuition. Some philosophers, like my first uh, thesis director, Terry Hench, uh, from Switzerland, call the uh, phenomenon le hasard, okay, which in French has near mystical meaning, you know, he's saying that it's, you know, something that happens just because it happens, okay. Well, in any case, there's no proof available for uh, such a definition of, a, of deity that surpasses our knowledge by definition, because God is the unknowable. This is the a priori principle that confronts us all. As such, neither me nor anybody other could answer that question. The question is moot in terms of a legal de deduction. That is, the question cannot be answered because there is no proof either that the deity exists nor proof that the, the deity does not exist. Therefore, it is a matter of uh, intuition and, uh, and faith, belief. And that's uh, as far as anybody, you know, can take the matter. So that would be my answer. The uh, next question here, how do you personally combine your political and your religious praxis and or identity? How do you personally find a balance between politics and spirituality? Well, first of all, and perhaps because of the fact that I, I don't really have a, a mishpucha, I don't have a family. You know, I'm, I'm an only child because my, my parents got together rather late. You know, my mother was 37 years old in the refugee camp in uh, Wetzlau in uh, American Germany. And uh, uh, all the rest of the family, you know, was killed off. There was only four out of 400 that survived, you know, from both families of my mother and father. And, uh, and so there's, you know, it's sort of, and because I moved away from, you know, my original city of Toronto, you know, there's nobody to celebrate any religious, you know, festivals with. So, you know, there's, a, you know, no practice involved. And because my, my son's mother was not Jewish, you know, she was, um, I think, Catholic from Nederland. So uh, my son, you know, uh, wasn't raised, you know, to be religious in any case. So I don't have, you know, a family with which to practice, you know, the religion with. And, you know, to treat the concept in and of itself, you know, I would refer to two notes that I wrote down here previously, that according to what I know as forming the Judaic culture, the idea of spirituality or a soul or a ghost are non-existent. There was furthermore no presentation of an afterlife, no heaven, no hell, in, you know, my Judaic, you know, religious education, much like uh, the John Lennon song, uh, Imagine. To take the word spirituality as a metaphor, though, one would be considering that which is identity or consciousness, collective consciousness, as well as the subconscious. So I would leave it as such. Um, and uh yeah, I, I think that's, <laughs> I'm still reading uh, the screen as well. This is a distraction for, an, um, but uh, no, I can't escape the whole screen to get back to my next question. <laughs> um, wait. Oh, what can socialists learn from their Jewish comrades? Yes. Um, collectivity and community honor. I wrote. Can you explain that a bit more? Uh, Jewish people have this sort of, you know, a culture whereby if uh, one Jewish person is in difficulty, they can ask another Jewish person who they do not even know to help them. And that second Jewish person is obliged to help them in the, you know, in, in the difficulty that the first Jewish person find themselves in. This is part of uh, community solidarity. 
and uh, right, you know, this is the sort of you know like the 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 first principles of uh, of of uh, individual relationships, individual relations, you know, within the Jewish community, uh, because uh, unlike you know the uh, individualistic competition that exists, you know, in society at large under capitalism and under uh, um, Western uh, Protestantism uh, and uh, Catholicism, Western Catholicism has its own peculiarities, you know, it's not quite the same. And it looks down upon the uh, aspiring uh, 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 greediness, you know, of the Protestants <laughs> in consequence of their, uh, of their individuality. But uh, uh, that as well as uh, the, nonetheless, the Catholic, you know, political culture is compatible uh, with the Jewish uh, political culture for uh, reasons other than, uh, than the uh, Protestant objection uh, by individuality. And the Catholic uh, problematic is the uh, hierarchy that is established. Whereas in the uh, Jewish uh, Judaic tradition, there is a, there are certain sort of, you know, like um, respect for authority uh, in terms of, you know, the elders, one, are being respected. Two, there is a commandment, you know, the Ten Commandments, to respect, you know, parents, you know, both mother and father, which is uh, the first, you know, like feminist, you know, definition of equality, as far as I'm concerned. Equality and uh, equity. And, uh, uh, but... Uh, you know, in the Catholic tradition, you know, the, you, you arise more with, you know, a feudal conception of society, which, you know, never included the Jewish people because Jewish people were never allowed to own any land. You know, they were sort of, you know, relegated to the margins, you know, of her cosmopolitan life, you know, in which they became artisans and uh, um, tradespeople, that sort of thing, and shopkeepers uh, because they, uh, they could not be peasants. So, you know, the the class structure of the Jewish people is entirely different than that, you know, which was represented, you know, by any of the other, you know, political cultures and their, and their doctrines. So that's, you know, like uh, what the Jewish political culture carries, you know, forward, you know, and is uh, elaborated, you know, by the Jewish comrades into uh, socialism, the Jewish conception of socialism. And then the same question, but the other way around. So what can uh, the Jewish people and uh, Jewish movements learn from their socialist comrades? Ah, I wrote uh, to embrace change as do the avant-gardists of the related cultures in the pursuit of socialism as the World Federation of Socialist uh, Nations. So, you know, evidently we're going to be living with other nations that are not Jewish that are Muslim and, and Christian in their sort of beliefs, not in terms of nation states, you know, but as political cultures. And that this is something that we'll live, you know, not in isolation from, but alongside of. And, uh, and therefore the, uh, the change that takes place in each culture is something that we can share and uh, learn from. The fourth question. Yeah, I, I think that um, a bit of the last question. So um, all the older comrades who have been active in, in the movement of Christians for socialism for several decades now get the question, do you want to share something from these years of experience? And the new people get the question, what are you expecting? But now we have an older comrade who has joined forces with us. So you get the, 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 the double question. What are the important lessons that you've learned uh, over the years? Um, and are there any things, any expect, uh, expectations or questions that you still have um, about how to work in unity with different people from different faith backgrounds uh, in a struggle for a socialist uh, system for a, a better world? Yes, well, the relations that I've been, uh, we have been able to establish are reciprocal in that uh, uh, we're not simply expected to act in solidarity with the, with uh, the other uh, oppressed sectors of society or nations of the world, but we also expect that we will be supported 
and uh, and solidarized, you know, with in our own plight, you know, against uh, anti-Semitism. And this is developed. This we have found the uh, a suitable response for amongst the uh, allies in our united front. And so we have, uh, we have the, uh, the blessing of having allies now against anti-Semitism uh, in the other you know, uh, liberation movements, uh, including uh, the, uh, the, the ideological uh, tendencies, you know, the national tendencies. And uh, this provides us you know, with uh, an optimistic basis on which to be able to develop further and not to sort of uh, uh, become defeatist in the face of the Holocaust and consider that we're isolated and have no hope of getting solidarity, you know, to defeat the greatest threats, you know, that have ever been inflicted upon humanity. So now we have something, you know, that um, is very valuable and that's, uh, you know, international, uh, you know, solidarity. And uh, uh, this is uh, something that, um, we are able to demonstrate, you know, with the Palestinians, and therefore became a model for working with the um, the other um, formations, social formations, in the United States, in England, uh, Canada, etc., and Mexico as well. We have a chapter in Mexico City with the uh, Facebook group um, Jewish Not Zionists, with more than seven thousand members. It has a is a primary uh, media source to overcome the censorship. So. Um, and in that group, you know, like a majority of the, of the uh, participants are Muslims, actually. <laughs> but Muslims, you understand, you know, what it is to be Jewish. So <laughs> it's working. We are actually told in our book, the Holy Quran, that we have to uh, motivate our Jewish comrades to go back to the Torah, to, to, to study the Torah and to live uh, by it. So, uh, Yes, yes. Even in terms of social relations, you know, it is uh, it is legal under Shaharia for a Muslim man to marry with a Jewish woman. Um, I think that, uh, and even if you look at um, how this comes from the Hadith, the reasoning behind it is that the most important things is that the children get a good um, education, an education where they learn uh, the important lessons in life, where they also learn to abstain from all kinds of idolatry, mm. which are still rampant. Yes. If you ask my opinion, are still rampant in our society because everybody kneels to the god Mars, the, of, uh, the god of war, to, to Mammon, the god of wealth. Yeah. All these idols are still very, they're yeah. um, ingrained in our culture. Yeah. 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 Um, as you were speaking about um, the fact that there are no liberation movements um, that take a clear stance against anti-Semitism, I think that um, in many of the movements that I've been present in, we still have problems with anti-Semitism and quite often unconscious, um, especially in some Muslim and Christian spaces, there are some uh, prejudices uh, against Jewish people that are still uh, quite endemic. Mm. Is there something you can say to teach the, the, the um, Christian and Jewish comrades what they should be mindful of? Uh, yes, um, there is a uh, problem, be not in inherent, you know, to the Oriental cultures, but rather because <clears throat> uh, during the uh, Nazi uh, regime days, uh, they had an uh, uh, sense, ostensible position that uh, was uh, anti-Zionist, you know. There were speeches made, you know, about the, the Jewish people acting as a, a colonialist, you know, coming to steal the land away from the Arab peoples. This was their uh, uh, beginning anti-Zionist position. At the same time, they made deals with the Zionists and, and were allies of, of the Zionists. So they were supporting the Zionists that they, that they were uh, declaring to be, you know, colonialists and against the interests of the Arab peoples. But to the Arabs, they wouldn't uh, talk about that. To the Arabs, they would say that they were there to help them fight against, you know, uh, Jewish imperialism. They didn't call it uh, Zionist imperialism. They called it Jewish imperialism because they wanted to create a prejudice against the Jewish people. And it uh, worked to a certain extent, you know. And, you know, the fallacy of this position can be demonstrated by a parallel because, you know, at the same time, 
the uh, the Japanese uh, military state was occupying part of uh, China, the northern part, Manchuria, and was on the advance, you know, to occupy all of China. And the rationale that they used at that time was that they were occupying China in order to liberate China from, you know, Western imperialism. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, if that's, you know, a laughable proposition, uh, which caused the death of, you know, 20,000, 20 million, you know, Chinese people over the course of the Second World War, until the Japanese, you know, were driven out. Well, you know, like, why use the same kind of a logic, you know, and apply it, you know, to, uh, to the Orient, you know, and the Arab peoples, you know, like, the argument that the um, Nazis were making, uh, that it, uh, that they were trying to save, you know, the Arabs and the Palestinians from Jewish imperialism is always, uh, you know, to be considered, you know, as a, a false proposition, you know, very much the same as the, uh, the Japanese lie that they were liberating in China, you know, from Western imperialism. So the, uh, the Nazis, of course, were trying to imperialize, you know, the Orient themselves, you know, because they were latecomers to the imperialist game. And so the uh, British and the French were ahead of them. And so they were opposed to British and French imperialism, of course. But, you know, that didn't mean that they were opposed to their own imperialism. So, and they weren't very successful in that, but they nonetheless, you know, had propagated, you know, their ideology to that effect amongst the uh, Arabs and Palestinians. And that has stuck to a certain extent. And nowadays, you know, the Palestinian solidarity movement also imports a certain degree of anti-Semitism into the game as well. So the uh, Palestinians though, uh, do have, you know, countermeasures to that, you know, in their educational system there, in which the uh, Palestinian teachers uh, are much more sophisticated than those either of those propositions and can criticize Zionism, not from an anti-Jewish perspective, but from an anti-imperialist perspective, anti-colonialist perspective. So, you know, that's the state of uh, affairs now, which is a very difficult. And so there's a, a marked division to be made, you know, within the solidarity movement so that, you know, the liberation of the Palestinians is not undermined, you know, by false arguments and uh, arguments that can be turned around against the Palestinians by the Zionists who can try to use that to say that the uh, Palestinians are only being motivated, you know, by racist uh, sentiments and not by sentiments of uh, national liberation. And that's the difference between the two. Very big problem. And can you say something specific about certain forms of Christian um, or typically Christian anti-Semitism, um, anti-Judaism that sometimes go back almost uh, 20 centuries? Oh, yes, I can. But I would um, um, add on one sort of, you know, a further point, you know, to the previous discussion in that, you know, I was saying that there was a countervailing tendency uh, in the Palestinian political culture by this by the teachers, you know, teaching in the UN schools. However, there is a, an even, you know, stronger sort of tendency, which has rejected the um, uh, Jewish conspiracy theories, has rejected the protocols of the elders of Zion, a uh, theory of uh, Jewish world domination, uh, that were a part of the original 1988, you know, Palestinian charter. And in 2011, they dumped that charter. Now they have a new charter, which does not uh, uh, target, you know, Jewish people or Judaism but it refers to Zionism as the source of the problem. So the Palestinian political culture is uh, very well developed and uh, it is up to the solidarity movements to achieve the same degree of sophistication. Now, um, oh, the current question that you just posed, um, I, I'm, I'm forgetting it now. Could you repeat that question, please? Um, can you say a few things about some typically Christian um, anti-Semitic tropes, myths, oh, yes. prejudices. Well, the original uh, uh, Christian um, definition of anti-Semitism was based upon uh, the rationale that um, the Jewish people as a people were responsible for the crucifixion, crucifixion of uh, Yehoshua ben uh, Yusuf, as I call him, Jesus Christ, which was not really his name, Christ being the Greek term for uh, uh, demigod, like uh, like the others. Um, so uh, this was a fabrication made uh, by whom? In whose interest would such a fa fabrication have served? Uh, uh, well, the uh, Roman Empire itself, because it was the uh, 
a Roman uh, consul representing the emperor of the Roman Empire who uh, ordered the uh, crucifixion of this uh, particular dissident. So uh, you can see that the motivation for that lie lies, lies with the uh, development of the, uh, the Christian uh, empire, Christendom, which was initiated by the rewriting of the gospels made by the uh, dynasty in the Roman empire called the, uh, what were they called? Um, the Vichian, I think they were called the Vichian uh, dynasty. That was the name of their family. <clears throat> they rewrote the gospel to say that there was going to be a, uh, a messenger coming, you know, uh, in the future, which just happened to coincide with the uh, declaration of the, uh, uh, the anointment of the emperor of the uh, uh, Roman Empire at that time, who then uh, proclaimed, you know, the uh, rewritten gospels to be the ideology of the Roman Empire and its justification. And, and therefore, um, they were uh, conducting uh, their operations against the Jewish people and the and uh, the later Crusades into the uh, into the eleventh, uh, on the basis that they were coming to liberate Jerusalem, you know, from the uh, from from us, <laughs> and then there's the uh, description, the historical description. There were various waves of uh, Crusaders. The first was from France, the when uh, the uh, the Holy Roman Empire was proclaimed after the, the breakup of the uh, Roman Empire. And the, uh, the Holy Roman Empire was uh, situated with a, uh, with a Pope in, uh, in Paris. And they sent a crusade, you know, which uh, would massacre, you know, Jews and, uh, and uh, Jewish and uh, Muslims, you know, on the way to, uh, to the uh, Orient. And uh, when they got there, they would occupy various cities, you know, set up, you know, uh, various consuls, you know, as in a feudal uh, tradition, until they came to Jerusalem, finally, where there was a general massacre of the uh, Jewish and Muslim population. And, uh, and this was uh, uh, described as uh, uh, rivers of blood that flowed in the streets of Jerusalem anchor, ankle high. The blood of both uh, the, the Jewish uh, people and the Muslims there mixed together in a river of blood. And uh, this was the first crusade. Then there was the next crusade by the, uh, by Germany when the uh, Holy Roman Empire switched over, you know, locale to there. And the uh, Templars, you know, went in to do the same thing. So, you know, this history, you know, of anti-Semitism, you know, from the Christ various Christian ideologies, Changed, you know, let's say to some degree, you know, with the Protestants, you began to read the, uh, the Old Testament, but they nonetheless, you know, developed um, conspiracy theories against Jewish people that served the same purpose and, uh, you know, considered that the evils of society like capitalism and money lending were, you know, created by Jewish people and uh, blamed it all on Christian, on, the, on Jewish people rather than on the Christian nation state. And the Christian empires. So, you know, Jews were a convenient target, you know, to misdirect people's anger, legitimate anger against their own oppression by blaming a, uh, a source which was uh, uh, invented for the purposes uh, of uh, preventing their, their own uh, liberation. So, uh, and it continues on as such, and we're still sort of, you know, caught in that in, in that paradigm. And, it, it, you know, you can see the various uh, tendencies that carry that overtly within the uh, solidarity movement that refer to uh, the Jewish state, the Jewish supremacy, uh, Jewish settler, uh, settlers, uh, Jewish uh, um, uh, supremacy, uh, Jewish apartheid, all these terms you know, are being imported into, uh, you know, the Palestinian solidarity movement, you know, by Western uh, radical liberals, you know, who are nonetheless uh, anti-Semitic to one degree or another. And even, you know, ex-Israelis who reject Zionism, reject it in a way that becomes sometimes anti-Semitism, like that character Gilad Altsman, who uh, works, you know, in, uh, in the United Front, you know, with uh, various fascist movements as well. And yet he's Israeli Jewish. 
Then there's Shlomo Sand, the intellectual in France, you know, who, who carries, you know, the argument that the, the Jewish people uh, are not uh, Jewish, they're Khazars, you know, or something like that. Even though, you know, speaking Yiddish, you know, it has nothing to do with uh, Khazaria. Wow. You know, these are all big problems. And uh, the Jewish Bund, you know, has to uh, stand up and present itself, you know, to uh, dispute, you know, these uh, propositions, which are not otherwise, you know, criticized by the, uh, the tendencies that are more assimilationist and that consider that uh, Jewish identity uh, is equivalent to a Zionist identity, do not consider a Jewish identity to be anything, you know, to be cherished or, or sought after or preserved or defended. And uh, actually they consider it something to be opposed and to be denounced. And, uh, and yet, you know, they call themselves Jewish at the same time. It's all very confused. Um, I'm not sure if we will solve this con uh, this confusion uh, today in this interview. Um, uh, thank you very much um, for speaking uh, to us and answering the questions. Um, I really hope that you can carry on for many, many more years uh, with this uh, great struggle. I will. Um, yeah, I am able to. I will. And we will try, inshallah by um, presenting your ideas uh, in this way to help inspiring a new generation because the struggle isn't over uh, by long and uh, we have been fighting it for 3,500 years ever since uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, the, 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 the great prophet and uh, one of the first uh, union leaders of the world mm -hmm. stood up against Pharaoh. Yeah. Um, but we're confident that one day we will be victorious. Yes. yes. Um, I thank you so much, you know, because I, I'm not uh, able to talk about these matters. Otherwise, there's no forum. There's no way to talk about these matters. Uh, then maybe this is a good idea to um, already invite you to have another interview at a later time, because I think that there's still far much more that you haven't said than uh, what you have said. So... Yes, um, of course. My whole doctoral thesis is about, you know, the identity of nation and how nation yeah. comes about. But, you know, when people react and have questions, you know, to this particular interview, then we can uh, come back and answer those questions again. Inshallah. That's, that's a good idea. Um, I hope I, I'm not butchering a language that is supposed to be very close to my own native language. Uh, but Abraham. Uh, Stay gesund. Shalom aleichem. I hope to see you uh, soon, and we have another chat about all the subjects that we couldn't uh, speak about today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. In, in Yiddish, I would answer, you know, briefly. Kaimel uh, nish uh, We say never again for everyone. Never again.